we were studying philosophical anthropology, and uh, I got to the point in my notes, I believe, where uh, having noted the presuppositional character of the questions, the major questions that are raised in philosophical anthropology, we were looking at the similar structure of uh, anthropological theories, that is, each of them tells you something about the nature of man or his dignity, each speaks of the dilemma or the diagnosis of man's problem, each speaks of the deliverance or the uh, gives a prescription for man so that he might um, be delivered from his problems. And on pages four to six of our um, textbook, there is a quick contrast and um, comparison of two conflicting systems, Christianity and Marxism. And uh, let's take a look at pages four to six as we get started today. Stevenson points out that um, each of these claims, each of these theories, makes claims about the nature of the universe as a whole. He says Christianity is committed to belief in God, uh, and Marx denied, of course, any belief in God, condemned religion as the opium of the people, distracting them from their genuine problems and answers social problems. Um, and now, as part of their conception of the universe, both of, both of these theories have beliefs about the nature of history. The meaning of history for the Christian is found in its relationship to uh, God, who is eternal. Uh, God is working out his purposes through history. And, of course, God's purposes center in the death, uh, the life and death, and we would say resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. Now, Marx, on the other hand, had a philosophy of history, and in it he claimed that there was a pattern of progress to be found in human history, but that progress was not related to anything eternal or transcendent. The progress of history was an internal matter altogether. Marx did believe there would be an inevitable development from one economic stage to another. So uh, feudalism gives way to capitalism. Capitalism is going to give way to socialism, socialism to communism. Okay. Now, Christianity and Marxism have different views of God, different views of history. They also have conflicting claims about the essential nature of the human being. The Christian says that man is made in the image of God and that uh, his destiny depends upon his relationship to God. Uh, the value of man uh, is that he survives physical death and he will face final judgment before God. Marxism, on the other hand, denies that there is any survival after death and therefore any judgment from God. It must therefore deny the importance of individual moral freedom that Christianity exalts as being a very um, important feature of uh, human nature. Uh, Marx says that our moral ideas and attitudes are really determined by the kind of uh, economic class in which we find ourselves living in the period of society in which we live, the period of history and the kind of society in which we live. Now, given this different view of God, history, and human beings, it's only um, natural that Christianity and Marxism are going to have different diagnoses of what is wrong with mankind. Okay, The Christian says that what's wrong with man is that he's alienated from God, that he's not living according to God's purposes, that his relationship with God has been disrupted, that he's misused his freedom, that he's rejected God. Marx, on the other hand, uh, replaces the notion of sin with the question, or I'm sorry, with the issue or matter of alienation. Um, man is not matching up to the ideal standard for human life. So what should be done to help man? The Christian, because of his different view of the universe, different view of man, different view of man's problem, is going to say that he must be made right with God through, the, through his son Jesus Christ, whereas the Marxist is going to have a completely different answer to the ills of human life. He's going to say we have to transform our society. We have to get to a classless society. We must advance the purposes uh, or the goals of economic revolution. Okay, page six, um, our author points out that implicit in these rival prescriptions or uh, deliverance schemes for man are somewhat differing visions of a future in which man is totally regenerated. Um, what is the Christian category that's being brought up here? What do we call this in theology, a vision of the future? 
an eschatology. There's a Marxist eschatology and there's a Christian eschatology. The Christian vision is of man restored to the state that God intends for him, freely loving and obeying his maker. Uh, the Marxist vision is of a future in this world, a perfect society in which men become um, their real selves, no longer alienated by economic conditions, but freely active in cooperation with each other. And so you have the Marxist society and you have the New Jerusalem as competing goals or eschatologies for man. So now this is what the book is hoping to achieve, to bring about this type of comparison between Marxism and Christianity, Marxism and Freudianism, uh, Sartrean uh, philosophy and uh, Skinnerian psychology and what have you. Now, the author does not do this for us throughout the book, however. That's what I'm expecting you to do on the final exam. Those uh, two and a half pages or so are a pretty good model of what I'm looking for when you write up your three pages, comparing paragraph by paragraph, if you will, uh, the different elements of each one of these philosophical anthropological systems. Now, on pages 122 to 124, Stevenson says there are major... Uh, disagreements between the presuppositions held by the seven different systems he inspects, he does allow for some complementary themes. That is, you'll find that these systems don't differ with each other at every single point. They complement each other, they supplement each other, and in many points there's compatibility between the theories. For instance, my, one might be an existentialist and a Marxist. It's conceivable that you could um, that you could blend them in some ways. There, there's compatibility at many points between existentialism and Marxism. Um, but having noted that there are these overlapping um, areas, similarities, uh, harmonies, and so forth, nevertheless, there are five major areas of disagreement. Five major areas of disagreement between the various theories. The first major question, and the reason I'm doing this, this comes at the end of the book, and the reason I'm bringing it up now is because as you go through formulating your answers, I think it's good that you know that this is one of the things that's really going to rub, you know, differently on each theory. These questions, I'm going to do them in reverse order from the way the author presents them, because I think the one he puts last is the one that we want to consider the most important. What makes the biggest difference in a person's philosophical anthropology? What is the key determining factor of a person's view of man? Presuppositional base. Is presupposition as to what? The nature of nature. Nature of man, but even more importantly than the nature of man, or if you will, determining the nature of man. The existence of God, that's right. Question of God. Okay, give me a couple of illustrations, uh, maybe more than a couple, from the uh, seven theories of human nature explored. Give me a few illustrations of uh, theories that do not believe in God. Okay. Okay, what did... Freud did not believe that there was a God. So what does God become? I mean, a lot of people talk about God. What is God, according to Freud? What is the idea of God? Is it just a fairy tale? Some some story somebody made up and we all made the mistake of believing it? Father figure left over from childhood. Exactly. The projection of one's father. Okay, so there if you will, there is something that takes the place of God as what what um, He's not just saying we all have this comic book story told to us about God and we make the mistake of believing it. There's some reason why people are impelled to believe in God. They have this, uh, this psychological neuroses. They need to believe in God. It's a God figure. Is it essential to Freud that there is no God? Is it essential to Freudianism that there is no God? Ultimately, yes. Ultimately, yes. Okay. What what is less than ultimate? Okay, you uh, before you might allow the existence of God at the beginning of his discussion and it would not necessarily appear to be a contradiction of his whole framework. But as you look out you're gonna end up with some contradictions if he allows the existence of God. Let's ask ourselves this, could a 
could a Christian, not a not a good one or a very self-conscious one, but could a Christian be a Freudian? Is it conceivable that God has so made man that there is a father wish in him? I think it's not only conceivable, I think the Bible teaches that. As a matter of fact, we all do have that inherent need to have a transcendent father. That's right. So Freud says people have this inherent urge to believe in a heavenly father. Does that mean that it's wrong? A lot of people assume that it is. See, we can explain your belief in God. You have the psychoanalytic need. Well, what if the answer to that is, yeah, and that's the way God made me, to need him. So it's conceivable that Freud and a belief in God could be harmonized, although the kind of God and the kind of man Freud talked about, I think, don't come anywhere close to the Christian conception. Now, as a matter of fact, did Freud believe in God? So what, um, so what is man? If there is no God, what is man? Not the image of God, obviously. Not a creature, yes? Well, man is going to have to do some of the work of God, obviously. He's going to have to create moral standards and that sort of thing. But what is man just in himself for a Freudian? He's an animal. He's an advanced form of animal. And therefore, it only makes sense that there be a comparison between analysis of animal behavior and, and human behavior, as you find in Lorenz, for instance, or Skinner. Okay, let me ask you this. We've seen in what sense the God, and, and, and how the God question can be uh, given a response by a Freudian. How about for a Sartrean, for an existentialist? For Sartrean existentialism, can there be a God? Depends on the individual. You'd be free to choose whether or not there is a God. No. I'd like to say yes, but that's just wrong. <laughs> Sartre says that the key element of existentialism, the beginning point of existentialism, is that there is no God. Because if there were a God, then our essence would be determined in advance. Our essence would have to be what God says it will be. And the key point of existentialism is that man first exists and then he chooses his essence. And since if there were a God, I couldn't choose my essence, it would be predetermined. There can be no God for existentialism. Okay, so you see that how important the question of God is for all of these theories. Christianity, of course, uh, makes the existence of God a key feature of its anthropology. Now notice the following. If you want, I'd give you some help in your apologetic and evangelism. If you want to know how you can get into discussing, you know, religious questions with people. It turns out any controversial issue, let's say what we should do about war, or about the economy, or about education, or about uh, sexual relations, or just about anything of interest and discussion among people, is going to depend upon a broader view of one's uh, anthropology. That is, uh, you don't tell animals, you know, to pray, uh, you know, for relief of their difficulties or all that. So clearly, what a, what a person thinks of man and society is going to determine what he does about this individual issue. And it turns out, if I'm right in what I'm saying here, that one's view of man is dependent more fundamentally upon his view of God. And so you can see that talking about any particular issue can get you into a discussion of what man is, and of course what man is is going to depend upon what, you view of, what your view of God is. And the only reason I'm bringing this out is because I want you to see how easy it is in a university setting or any setting to end up talking about religion. Now, a lot of people think you know they have to make some kind of uh, blunt appeal to the four spiritual laws or they have to uh, you know, introduce the theory you know, out of the blue, but it's the most natural thing in the world to talk about God God's at the center of every conversation. Because in essence, what you think of God is what you th is going to determine what you think of man, is what you're going to think about what you're talking about. Whether you're talking about the Cleveland Indians or whether you're talking about sexual morality. All is going to depend upon your view of man. But that, that's not superfluous. What, if, if you have Lorenz's view of man, what do you make of the Cleveland Indians? 
What's happening when people go out and play competitive athletic games? That's right. What are we working out? We're working out our animal past. Animals have this sort of, uh, uh, well, it's a warring type of instinct within them. Uh, uh, they work out their hostility. And so that you'll find a male buck, for instance, is going to fight any other male buck that gets on his territory. So the Cleveland Indians are going to see to it that anybody, even if they're called angels, comes in, you know, and they're going to protect their territory. Now, you may not think that's very credible, but given somebody's view of man, when he goes to the ball game, he may, you know, have a beer and a hot dog and enjoy it like you, but he thinks what's going on is people are working out their aggression in a very civilized way. We have umpires and rules and all the rest and uniforms. We're not going to get bloody over it, but still, that's the background for all of this. Whereas a Christian is going to look upon the Cleveland Indians in a different way, or any other team. I mean, Cleveland Indians may be a poor choice of example here, but what's a Christian going to say about the athletic or, or uh, if you will, uh, recreational activities of men? They're working out something very deep and, and uh, essential to their nature and character? No. This is, as a matter of fact, superfluous play. And we have the freedom to do that because we are free human beings. God gives us recreation. Oh, you ever thought about the word recreation? What is the word recreation? Recreation. Recreation, exactly. Now, I'm not going to get into etymology, and the whole, but you see, the whole background to recreation comes from the freedom we have because God has recreated us. We can harmonize with each other. We can play games and, and, and have fun and have free time and all that. It's part of the goodness of God. But, uh, of course, that isn't the view anymore. Anyway, the question of God is crucial to all these theories. Well, driving from the question of God or related to how you answer the question of God is going to be the question of the nature of moral values. You know, the question of God and the question of morality, moral values. First of all, are moral values objective or subjective? Are they objective or subjective? Plato asserted the objectivity of moral values, saying that the form of the good is the objective, trans-temporal, trans-human, trans-relative standard of good and evil. At the very opposite end of things, you have um, Skinner, who says that there's no basis for values at all. Values are simply what's chosen by the um, person who's doing the conditioning of another person or thing. They are people who think that the values that are held by people are, are determined by their society, Marx and Freud in particular. There are those who say we must choose our values completely without guidance, Sartre. So you can see how this whole question of the status of uh, moral values is a critical one in each one of the theories of human nature that you're going to be looking at. I think it's interesting as we go through these questions to start looking at how the various authors of the various philosophers being examined are grouped on how they answer these questions. Um, how, what basic groups can we get on the question of God? Obviously, Christianity believes in God. Is there any other theory that's being proposed that obviously is the theistic theory? Platonism comes the closest. There is some question as to whether Plato actually believed in the gods or whether he's only using mythological uh, ways of speaking um, to express his views or to veil the fact that he was really getting away from the theism of his day. But you'd have Christianity, Plato, you know, there'd be some distance there. And then, of course, on the other side, you'd have Freud, Skinner, uh, Sartre, who else are we studying these days? Marx and Lorenz. How about on the nature of moral values? 
Well, again, you have Christianity and Plato holding to the objectivity of moral values. Then you have another group that says there's no basis for moral values at all. Skinner, Sartre, he says we have to choose our values. And then there'd be those who say moral values are a reflection of one's society. Freud and Marx. Another major question that um, uh, is differently answered by each one of these theories is uh, the question of materialism versus dualism. Does man have a mind or a soul, or is man completely a material object? Does man only have a brain? It's what in philosophy is called the mind-body problem. Is man only a body, including a brain, a physical feature of man, part of his body, or is there a mind in man or characterizing man that goes beyond the body or the brain? Is man completely materialistic, or should you have a dualistic view of man that he's made up of two different sorts of things, or are there are two different aspects to man? Materialism and dualism. Okay, our author says Plato is definitely a dualist, and I agree. Plato would be over here with those who believe that man is two types of things. He is a body as well as a mind. And Skinner is clearly a materialist. Marx is also a materialist, it turns out. Believes that uh, everything develops from physical forces in man. Is Freud a materialist? Not quite so obvious. He does seem to speak of a psyche. Whether that's subject only to the uh, determinants and factors of the brain, it's another matter altogether. And so we have to put, if you will, Freud on the line. We're not sure what to make of Freud when it comes to dualism or materialism. How about Christianity? Think before you answer. If we did not believe in the intermediate state, I think just about everything in the Bible would lend credence to a materialistic view of man. Materialistic doesn't mean, by the way, atheistic, does it? It just simply means that man is a created being. He's created out of physical stuff of some sort. Of course, we do believe that when the body is dead, there's going to be an aspect of man, sometimes called spirit or soul, that will know communion with God. And so Christianity is dualist in one sense, that it believes that there's a spiritual aspect to man, but whether that spiritual aspect must be interpreted as a substance, a soul in the Platonic sense, is another question altogether. My guess is that will probably come as a surprise to most of you to, to be told that the Christian view of the soul is not necessarily what Plato was saying. Most Christians have a Platonic view of the soul. The soul is a ghost in a machine. We have the machine of our body, and then we have a little spirit or ghost inside of us, and the ghost goes away at death. And the ghost is restored to the machine, now a much better machine, at the resurrection. Well, while that's easy enough to think about, and easy enough to fall into as a conception of man, there's very little evidence that the Bible conceives of man as a ghost in a machine. So, is Christianity monistic or dualistic? The tendency is to put Christianity toward Platonism just because we do believe in an afterlife. Okay? But uh, whether we should understand that in the Platonic way is another question altogether. Okay, now we come down to another basic question, the question of determinism versus free will. Oh, I was going to say over here, on materialism and dualism, Sartre is an obvious materialist as well. He doesn't believe there can be anything um, spiritual, because anything spiritual would operate as an unknown force um, threatening the freedom of man to make his own decisions as to his essence and his future his moral values and all the rest. Okay, now on determinism and free will, you have those who believe that man makes his own choices. And you would have 
Christianity, believes that man is a morally responsible creature. Who else thinks that man has free will? Sartre. Exactly. Sartre thinks free will is the essence of man, in fact. Now, over against Christianity and Sartreanism, there would be those who think that man is determined by causes outside of himself. An obvious example? Marx. Marx? What cause? What kind of determinism does Marx believe in? Economic. Economic determinism. Skinner would be a determinist as well. What kind of determinist is Skinner? Biological or environmental, actually. What kind of uh, uh, conditioned response is built in from your society is going to determine what you are. How about Freud? Is Freud a determinist? Yes, very definitely he is. What kind of determinism? Psychological determinism. He believes that there are, if you will, deep forces that are you know, welling up within us like a volcano that are making us do what we do and feel as we feel. Those forces are built into us because of our society and uh, our sexual nature and other things, but nevertheless there are forces that go beyond our own conscious free choices. Now as we, do, as we go through this, um, this list and make these groupings, it's of uh, some interest to see how um, the different players end up on different sides of the line, who is grouped with whom, if you will. Here we have a few where Christianity and Platonism tend to be very similar, which explains, by the way, why throughout history there's been a real urge for Christian philosophers to be Platonist, because there is, if you will, a formal similarity. But now we get down here, Christianity and Sartre stand over against Marx, Skinner, and Freud, whereas Christianity stands over against Sartre and the others up here. Where, where does Plato go down free will? I don't, I'm not sure that we get an answer to that question. I can think of different ways of approaching it. I can't think of any obvious way in which Plato would be a determinist. Uh, Plato does think that man is encased in a body. He's a soul encased in a body, trapped in the tomb of the body. Uh, and so it may be that our desires and our physical nature have grip of us from time to time. But he also believes that the the reasonable man, the equitable man, the just man is one who lets reason dominate his body and that would tend to support the idea that he has free will. The point I'm trying to make, however, is that we cannot assume that these five questions uh, line up the different theories. They don't. There is a mishmash and crisscrossing of the players and there'll be like, there's a question as to what to make of Freud or of Plato on this one question and um, so forth and so on. Uh, sometimes uh, theory gives a very clear answer to one of these questions. Sometimes it gives uh, an ambiguous answer to these questions. Sometimes it finds itself set over against an opponent and then later on that opponent is on the side of the theory when it comes to um, further question. So we mustn't think that this very simply sorts everything out. Okay, now the fifth question finally that is seems to um, control various theories and set them apart from each other is a question of how innate human nature is over against its possibilities for change. The innateness or controlledness of human nature. How set is human nature over against, if you will, a flexible and changeable conception of human nature. Stevenson says, how much in human nature is innate, how much is learned from the social environment? There are many ways of putting this contrast. This is um, page 121, by the way. And so let's look at the various ways of putting this contrast. Um, the contrast between the biological and the cultural. There are some people who say human nature is determined by one's biology, and others will say one's culture determines what human nature will be. Now, if it's biological, anything born into the species of human being is going to have the same basic human nature. If human nature is cultural, then, of course, what you find in the South Sea Islands and what you find in Germany of the uh, 15th century may be completely different human natures, or radically different, anyway. 
Okay, there's a contrast between heredity and environment. How much is determined by our by our background and genes and all the rest, our heredity, how much is determined by the environment that we presently are experiencing? There's a contrast between nature and nurture, which is a cute way of putting it. That is, there's a, an essence to man, his, his nature, but then there's a question of how he's nurtured, how he's brought up. Okay, it, when you watch stories of the wolf boy on TV, you know, the boy who was raised by wolves and so forth, and this, you see, is but a popular way of raising the philosophical question of human nature. Is human nature something innate, or is it something that's a matter of nurture? The man's brought up by wolves, is he a wolf? Or is he still a human being with wolf characteristics? A uh, question of the contrast between the individual and society. How much depends upon you as a, as a separate individual and what you are? How much is uh, a reflection of the society around you? The contrast can be stated between that of instinctual and conditioned behavior. How much do we do just as a matter of what we are by instinct? How much is just conditioned in us? There are some people who would say we have no instinct at all. It's only a matter of conditioning. Others would say that conditioning is um, almost nothing, that we just do what we do by instinct as other animals. Okay, or a contrast can be stated between that which is universal, inevitable, and unchangeable over against that which is culture relative, subject to change and reform. Okay, and our author says that Plato, Marx, and Skinner emphasize the extent of social conditioning and our power to change individuals by changing social structures and practices. Plato, Marx, and Skinner then have, if you will, malleable theories of human nature. That the society around about you uh, plays a very important role and is very um, is a key to determining what kind of person you will be. Christianity, Freud, and Lorenz emphasize the limits um, to such change created by one's environment or society and therefore come down hard on the innate universal nature of man, the instinctual, biological, essential nature of man. And now these are the five questions then that our author thinks um, are the most telling, the ones that are not settled by the various um, theories. These are the, these are the theories that will, are the questions that will set the theories over against each other. Um, these are unresolved issues. It's of interest to me that he thinks this fifth question is an empirical or a scientific question. He thinks the fifth question is, a, is something that's to be settled on the basis of evidence. Let's just line up the evidence, let's do our experiments and find out how malleable is human nature. Can we actually create a wolf boy or not? Or is there something, you know, instinctual and essentially human about uh, people? He says the other four questions are um, philosophical in character. No amount of scientific evidence is going to settle the question of determinism of free will, materialism and dualism, the nature of moral values, or the existence of God. Those are all questions of a philosophical order. Are you convinced by that um, breakdown? It does seem to me that a person's view of the innateness or flexibility of human nature is also a philosophical question. I think what you really have here are varying degrees where empirical or scientific evidence influences the way you answer the question. There's a sense in which empirical evidence will help you determine whether there's a God. Right? We believe that a lot of empirical evidence points to the existence of God. It's also true that the God question is the furthest away from empirical evidence because what you think of God determines how you're going to approach the evidence. And so if he wants to put this on a sliding scale, I tend to think the flexibility or innateness of human nature probably comes the closest to being a scientific question, but I don't believe it is, as a matter of fact, a scientific question. I can imagine people knowing all the same facts and having all the same data before them and nevertheless disagreeing as to the nature of, uh, of the human being because they'll explain the data in different ways depending on what they actually think man is.
his differentiation is consistent with his initial discussion of verificationism. How's that? Well, he gives a high view of science and the fact that a, a theory cannot be verified doesn't mean we throw it out, but it lacks a very important crediting factor. It's not a scientific theory. That's true. But why is it that he would make this one question scientific and the other is philosophical, do you think? He obviously is convinced that it is open to scientific inspection information. Okay, but you see, I can think of reasons why we would think it's not really open or completely determined by scientific evidence. Okay empirical evidence and so I'm not quite sh uh, what I'm saying is when I read that I thought well that's, that looks a little um, arbitrary to me uh, e even arbitrary given his previous um, commitments and values as expressed in the book now if I'm right that uh, these are the five essential questions that keep arising as you study these various theories and if I'm right that these are all essentially philosophical, which is to say philosophical theological questions, how are we going to resolve these differences? How does one, if you will, adjudicate the difference between uh, conflicting philosophical anthropologies? How does a Christian, if you will, deal with a Marxist, a Skinnerian, a Freudian, a Sartrean? How does a Sartrean deal with a Marxist? How do they convince each other? How do they argue with each other? How do they resolve their differences? How does anyone know for sure? How, what kind of questions are these? These are metaphysical questions, aren't they? Apart from this one here, which is obviously a question about the nature of moral values, and that is very much dependent upon metaphysical issues itself, <coughs> Here's the question of materialism versus dualism. Is man got a soul or not? Determinism versus free will. Uh, are, we, are we part of a causal nexus that uh, completely takes away our freedom or not? Is our human nature flexible, determined by something outside us or something inherent to us? Does God exist? These are all metaphysical questions. They go beyond the physical. They stand behind the physical. These are philosophical questions. How do you resolve metaphysical questions? Okay, I'd like to continue with this line of thought for a minute. Oh, okay, go ahead then. Do you think the social structures over the years that affected any of these theories, wars and Oh, I think it's, I think the uh, character of one's society does set uh, an attitude and a feeling about people. Sure, there are pessimistic ages and optimistic ages. There are ages that um, in which people can do very little philosophical reflection. It takes every bit of their strength simply to eke out a living. There are ages that see a great deal of luxury and free time, and therefore there's a lot of philosophical speculation made possible. So I think the character of one's age might be an influential factor in how he approaches the uh, philosophy of man, but I don't believe that um, uh, the character of one's age determines what he's going to think about man. I think it influences, but I don't think it in any sense. Because there are people that hold all these different kinds of theories in all different kinds of ages. So the changes have been made them to look onto God rather than their own philosophical life, um, Dri driving them back to God in that sense. Maybe human philosophies have failed, it didn't turn out to be the way they expected, and uh, give them an idea of uh, looking back to God in the answer, or changing their views on God. Well, there's a sense in which that happens, yes. But uh, it, it also is the case, and I think it's more usually the case, that one's view of God determines what he makes of the success of his anthropological theory. Okay, let, let us say that I believe that there is a, um, a planet beyond uh, Pluto. Okay, is Pluto the furthest out in our solar system? 
So I thought, okay, I think there's another planet in our solar system, one beyond Pluto. Okay, now we haven't observed it with a telescope, but I mean, all the activity of other planetary bodies and their orbits and all that suggests an influence of another planet yet to have been observed. Okay, and now to confirm this theory, I um, decide to have uh, the United States government build the best uh, telescope that's ever been built, some huge, monstrous telescope, really uh, has uh, critical abilities and uh, magnitude and all the rest. And so we put the telescope together and we look in the sky where this uh, uh, hypothesized or projected planet is supposed to be and we don't see it. Now at that point I could say, well, my theory didn't work, I have to go back and reconsider a bunch of other things, as you're suggesting somebody might do. But I may be so committed to the theory that I'd say there's something wrong with the telescope. Or I might say there was, a, uh, if you will, a cloud cover. Or there, if you will, there's some kind of cosmic dust that's interfering with light rays coming from the planet. Or, you know, there's, I could go ahead and, and ad hoc, add on to my theory to salvage, you know, um, my uh, preconceived notions, my presuppositions. It all depends on how much I have invested in, how much I'm committed to my theory. It's conceivable people living in one kind of age having one theory of man would, um, uh, we would think, be led to see that their theory of man just isn't holding water, just isn't working out, and they should go back and reconsider their, their view of God. But as a matter of fact, they, uh, they could go the other direction. They could hold on very desperately to their theory and make modifications in it. They could, you see, say that we know for sure that man is an animal, and therefore if he seems to be acting as a spiritual being, you know, showing that he isn't conditioned completely by his environment. What we need is to study it more. There's always this eschatological cop-out that says, just give us more time, we'll be able to explain this phenomenon too in terms of our theory. So it really goes both ways. But now my question is, how do we resolve metaphysical disputes of the nature that we see in the board? Well, that, to ask that question is to ask, what epistemology does one have? How does one know anything for sure? What amounts to knowledge? What establishes conditions of evidence and truth? If one's epistemological theory um, is going to determine how he adjudicates metaphysical conflicts, then the question is going to become, how do we resolve the different epistemological disputes between these theories? You see, Plato says that men know things on the basis of their intuition because of their acquaintance with the realm of the forms previous to their bodily existence. Men pre-existed as souls living in familiarity with the forms. Now we come into this world in a body and we have a vague recollection of the realm of the forms. That's why we can do geometry and math and we can distinguish ducks from cats and all the rest. We know the forms. Marx says that what we know, we know only on the basis of sense experience, only on the basis of generalizations from particular experiences that we know about because of our senses. How are we going to adjudicate these epistemological differences? How do we know what amounts to evidence and truth and knowledge? Well, I mean, that's one way to do it. We could say, let God answer the question. But, of course, if you hold to a theory that doesn't allow for there being a God, then he's not going to want to let God answer the question because he doesn't think there's a God to answer the question. Oh, so apparently we have to answer our epistemological question, how to adju we have to know how to know the... In order to know what amounts to genuine evidence and truth and knowledge, one has got to consider his epistemological theory, I mean his metaphysical theory what he thinks of man, the universe, reality, his categories, and all the rest. But that's just the difficulty. These are metaphysical questions that are separating the theorists. To adjudicate the differences on these questions of metaphysics, one has got to appeal to his epistemology, or rest on his epistemology. His epistemology, in turn, rests on what? His metaphysics. Now, the next time somebody gives you a hard time about circular reasoning, just remember the lesson of today's class. 
I mean, it'd be very nice if we could all say, well, we're not going to reason in a circle, you know, we're not going to be like those presuppositionalists. I mean, if it were possible not to reason in a circle when it comes to these ultimate philosophical questions, we'd all be happy to do it. It isn't so much that some people are preferring circular reasoning or transcendental philosophical reasoning over against scientific straight line reasoning. It isn't as though you have a choice between presuppositionalism and empirical apologetics. The fact of the matter is we can't avoid circular reasoning. Our epistemological standards are going to be influenced and determined by our metaphysical commitments. And our metaphysical commitments and conflicts are going to be resolved and set down by our epistemological standards. And so again, we're returning here at the end of our course to the beginning of our course, which is somewhat appropriate in light of what I'm telling you. Because at the beginning of the course, I told you that the nature of philosophical disputes is a presuppositional one. How will Freud and Skinner, how will Skinner and Sartre resolve their differences? By arguing from their presuppositional viewpoint. They're going to have, but how do you how do you resolve the differences or the conflicts between presuppositions? There's nothing more ultimate to which you can appeal. Thank you. I was just going to say how soon we forget, but that that is very encouraging today. It makes my day. We compare the worldviews, the adequacy of the worldviews. As it turns out, at best, Sartre and Skinner are going to have an inter-family dispute. Ironically, all these other six theories that you're going to read about in this book have one thing in common, that they're all against Christianity. Okay? And therefore, when Sartre and Skinner argue, there will be a little bit, you know, they can argue back and forth and see inconsistencies in each other. But when all is said and done, it's going to be the Christian worldview set against all these other worldviews as the only one that can do justice to what man is, how he's operating, how he can salvage truth, significance, meaning, and all the rest. If man is not what Christianity says he is, then there are going to be um, things that we just can't explain. There's going to be irrationality in our philosophy. Now let me put in just a little plug here, although it's not a, by any means a complete endorsement. But it's just at this point that I think Francis Schaeffer has been found so helpful by many, um, by many Christians who are studying apologetics. Schaefer is not a rigorous apologist. He's not a, a super sophisticated philosopher by any means. But I do believe there's some value in what Schaefer is doing because he is arguing, without saying so, within the realm of philosophical anthropology. You know, he talks about the mannishness of man and what gives man dignity and freedom and love. Schaefer is talking about the kinds of issues that are up on the board. And what Schaefer is pointing to by doing a comparison of worldviews when he does it correctly, and sometimes he does it um, in a rationalistic way that uh, I'm sorry to see, but when he is reasoning as a presuppositionalist, Schaefer is pointing out things such as that the materialistic scientist goes home from work, and at work, of course, he's living according to his theory where everything is just uh, uh, physicalistic and a matter of... Uh, uh, material or scientific or empirical laws, but he goes home and he kisses his wife. You know, he, he shows that he is committed to a realm of love and value and significance and dignity. Now, if man was only an animal, there'd be no room for love. There'd only simply be physical relations between people. There'd be no questions of justice in our law courts and all the rest. It'd just be a dog-eat-dog -dog world, to use the metaphor. And so even the man who holds to a certain anthropology, such as materialism, betrays his anthropology in another area of his life. He can't, you see, put together a consistent world and life view. That is to say, a view as well as the practice of his life just uh, can't be harmonized. And so the value of today's lecture, I hope, is to point out not only what the key questions are as you go through these theories, but the value of today's lecture is to remind you that the only way to resolve the conflicts between these theories is going to be on a presuppositional basis, 
a comparison of ultimate worldviews. The total view of one's metaphysic, his anthropology, his epistemology, his ethic, and how they harmonize and how they are adequate for uh, the practices and the views of men. It seems that few of the proponents of these other views are willing to examine their recent positions. You say few are willing to do so. Is, is that your suggestion? I want to make sure I heard you right. Um, if you mean examine in the sense of question, I think you're undoubtedly right. Uh, few, uh, Freud would probably not have wanted to question his conviction that man was an animal, that was conditioned by his sexual and his social nature. Um, that was probably not one of the negotiable parts of Freudianism. There may have been other things, higher level developments in his theory, but that was fundamental to it all. Marx certainly would not question the materialism that's foundational to his view of economic determinism. And, as a matter of fact, Christians are not going to question the existence of God. I will question it in the, in the sense that we'll be glad to compare worldviews but that's because we're convinced in advance that only the Christian worldview will work out. Only the Christian view can give the preconditions of knowledge. You know, what is the Christian view of man? Let's see if we can, in remaining moments here, uh, outline a Christian view of man to be set over against the other six theories. What is the nature of man, the dignity of man, according to Christianity? First three chapters of the Bible tell us not only the nature of man but also the nature of his problem, if you will, his dilemma. Man is a creature of God. Man is created by God, but he's created as a very special kind of creature. He appears to be the epitome of creation. He is the, if you will, creature that is set over all other creatures and realms of creation. And he is and he has this dignity and function or status in light of the fact that God creates him as his own image. Animals do not image God in his rationality, his morality, his personality, and his dominion. But man does. What man is physically, God is non-physically. Man can see, man can relate, man can reason, man can make moral choices, man can exercise sovereignty. God does all these things without a physical body. And so man is the physical image of God. That isn't to say that he is in his human body a reflection of God's body, but man is in a human body what God is without a human body. And that's the dignity of man. He's positively related to God as God's own image having abilities, a function, a character that is beyond that and unique with respect to the animals. Man has a future. He is immortal. He will always be related to God in some way. Now, it may be in a negative and cursed way, but he will never escape, if you will, his um, relationship, positive or negative, to God. He survives, if you will, eternally. What is the nature of man's dilemma? It's moral, not metaphysical, not, if you will, historical or essential. It isn't as though man has a bad society conditioning him or that man's made out of bad stuff. Like Plato says, he has a physical body which is dragging him down. The nature of man's problem is moral rather than uh, metaphysical. That is, he has chosen to rebel against God. So there's a moral difficulty in man. And the prescription for man, the deliverance for man, as you know as evangelical Christians, is by God's grace. The perfect man, the God-man, Christ Jesus, dies as the sacrificial substitute. Man is reconciled morally to God, judicially to God, by the death of God's own Son, the perfect man. And therefore man is in his spiritual being regenerated now 
and understands the promise of a physical regeneration called re resurrection in the future. Man will nevertheless die because of the consequences of sin. His body will decay, but he will know the presence of God or absence from the presence of God immediately at the time of his death, and his body will one day be resurrected and will live either in um, communion with God or in uh, disharmony and, um, and separation from God for all eternity. So essentially, the Christian says that man's dignity in nature is that of the image of God. God is brought into the question immediately. The problem with man is a moral problem. He's rebelled against God. The answer is a theological answer, regeneration from God, being recreated as the image of God. And that answer is worked out in two steps, spiritually now, physically later. And so that shows us something about the character of man, too, that there is a physical and a spiritual aspect to his being. And now as we go through the uh, six theories on Friday and look at which each, what each one of them says about the uh, nature, the problem, and the, and the answer, a solution for man, I'd like to take this very th brief thumbnail sketch of Christian anthropology and use it as a foil over against each one of the other theories so we can see the uniqueness of the Christian world and life view when it comes to philosophical anthropology. Um, rather than jumping into that right now, we're only a few minutes from uh, when we should stop, and I think we'll stop here after I give you a chance for questions. Any questions on today's lesson or last time? We continue to talk about Christianity as a monolithic belief. Yes. Uh, when when you do, are you referring to it that um, if we follow it as, as if it was written, it would be monolithic? We don't. What I what I will um, take as Christianity is biblical Christianity. That is, Christianity is defined by the Bible. Now, immediately you're going to say, but people interpret the Bible differently. I grant that, but I do not grant that the Bible is a wax nose to be uh, formed in any shape or direction as you want it to be formed. While we have, because of sin, the difficulty of dif disagreements and uh, obscurities and confusions in the interpret and mistakes in the confusion of the Bible, uh, I do believe, as a presupposition of Christian theology, that the Bible has one message, not many messages. You recall how Paul says when he writes to the church, um, our letter to you was not yea and nay. Paul says, we didn't write some kind of a dialectical theology to you where you could take it this way or take it that. Paul says, I have a very definite message for you. And there is a definite message in the Bible, although Christians, because of the remaining sin in them, are going to differ over as to what, what that is. For the most part in this class, I've tried to hold to a pretty... Um, uh, if you will, center of the road evangelical approach to Christian theology. Most of what I'll be saying about anthropology, uh, just about any evangelical Christian, I think, would grant. We've had points, obviously, when it comes to free will and determinism, where some differences among evangelicals have played a part. But that's inevitable. I mean, uh, since I don't believe the Bible equivocates, I have to think the Bible teaches one way and not the other. And, uh, and at those points, my own theological convictions have been determinative in the lectures. And with anthropology, the same will be true. It's just I don't see a whole lot of room for uh, controversy over, for instance, my view of anthropology as just outlined. Most evangelicals would say that. Most neo-orthodox would not. Okay, so I mean, there's, there's always going to be a question of you know, the circle within which you are operating as a scholar, and I'm operating within the evangelical orbit. Other questions? Uh, the fifth uh, problem of the innateness versus selectable. Uh, I agree with the way you put it up there. However, our sin nature is exchanged. Uh, we are changed. How does that fit in? Seems that that's being defined in a way that we, we have an essential nature rather than a changing nature. Well, that what changes, of course, is our spiritual relationship to God. It doesn't seem to me that that our human nature changes. Okay. Now, 
little insight. This is the traditional reform view of the image of God. There is an image of God in the narrow sense and in the broad sense. Okay? In the, um, in, in, in the broad sense, everybody is God's image, even unbelievers, because they are distinct from the animals and they maintain their human dignity as a special creation set apart for a special task by God, having immortality, the ability to reason, make moral decisions, and so forth. Okay? But in the narrow sense of the image of God, actually imaging God morally or spiritually, doing what you're supposed to do, um, not all of us are. If you will, it's kind of like a, a car. Uh, cars going different directions on the um, interstate are both cars, although they're going different directions. Now, if it so happens that cars have been made to go one direction, and only one direction, then those that are going the opposite are rebellious cars. But they're rebellious cars and not non-cars. And so I'm maintaining that there is an essential human nature, and it will be essentially human even in hell. But there are some people who, are, even though they are not non-human, are acting in an anti-human way. They're acting contrary to their human nature in the narrow sense of what God created them to be. So I should say what changes is essentially the moral aspect of man and not the metaphysical aspect of man. Redemption, the fall and redemption are not metaphysical matters. Even unbelievers will be resurrected, but to the resurrection of damnation. They will suffer in their physical bodies for all eternity. And so that is, that is a crucial point in, in Reformed theology, by the way, that that uh, the fall and redemption are not metaphysical. Now, they are in Roman Catholic theology. And I tend to think they are in Arminian theology to some degree as well. But Reformed theology has consistently stressed that the fall of man is moral in character and therefore is redemption.